there is nothing wrong with inheriting the family business or following in the footsteps of those who came before you, as long as the path you choose leads to your purpose and destiny. But consider this, taking the road less traveled can often lead you to your divine calling. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Jamaica Magazine. I am your host, Audrey Williams. We have a fantastic show packaged for you today, and within it you may discover how you can forge your own path to what may become a success story. So, stay put. We'll be back after the news. On our roads, remember, take time, be courteous, drive good, walk good. Don't drink alcohol and drive. Don't drive tired or sleepy. Don't tailgate and don't overtake unless it is safe to do so. And always drive at a speed which will allow you time to stop quickly and safely. Let's keep it safe on our roads. Good day, I'm Theodore Henry, and this is your GIS News for Friday, March 10, 2023. Starting this September, beneficiaries of the Program of Advancement through Health and Education, PATH, no longer need guarantors to apply to the Students' Loan Bureau, SLB. Minister of Finance and the Public Service, Dr. Nigel Clark, announced the policy change as he opened the budget debate on Tuesday. In addition, we'll waive the application fee for students from PATH households. My Speaker, we are preserving, maintaining, increasing, and sharing the gains of economic reform and economic recovery. This allowance for PATH beneficiaries follows the successful implementation of a no-guarantor policy for wards of the state. Minister Clark says with its introduction, the Students' Loan Bureau is now receiving 98 applications from that category, up from 46 the previous year. In addition to extending the policy to PATH beneficiaries, the SLB will also be providing grant support to students on the program. For the 2023-24 year, students from PATH households or from households with income less than 1.5 million the Student Loan Bureau plans to make an additional 4,200 non-refundable grants of $60,000. Highlighting the continued improvements in operations at the SLB, Minister Clark says a new loan management system, which was launched in June 2022, will be fully implemented during the 2023-2024 fiscal year. It involves online loan repayment, balance queries, and loan statements. Government will be providing full tuition scholarships for 1,250 STEM teachers over the next five years. 250 scholarships will be awarded to science, technology, engineering and mathematics STEM teachers each year. According to Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark, this move is to increase the teacher training intake. Dr. Clark points out that a recent project with the Education Ministry shows that teacher training intake in STEM subjects would increase by 100% if scholarships and other incentives were offered. He says what pertains is that only a small fraction of the 15% of CSEC students who sit STEM subjects qualify to enter teacher training. In response to that need, Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Finance, through the Student Loan Bureau, in support of this government effort, will partner with the Michael University College, the oldest teacher training college in the Western Hemisphere, to provide full tuition scholarships to 1,250 STEM teachers over the next five years. Minister Clark says this will ensure that there are sufficiently qualified teachers to fill existing gaps in high schools and drive STEM transformation. Scholarship recipients will be bonded to the government to discourage exit from the classrooms and will repay the bonds if their service contracts are broken. Government will be establishing a $1 billion Jamaica screen fund to provide financing for the development and production of film and television shows in the country. As he opened the 2023-2024 budget debate on Tuesday, Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark said the money would be provided over two years with $500 million in the new fiscal year. The fund is to enable creatives to devote time and sweat equity into developing their projects to the point where they can receive financing. 
It will also support the production of films by providing a defined percentage of the production costs, with a maximum contribution for local productions and other percentages and thresholds for foreign films being shot in Jamaica, once certain criteria are met. Minister Clark says it marks government's continued support for the growth of the local film, television and animation industry. Hundreds of persons can be employed in a single production, sometimes for months. In addition, the production of film and television generates indirect and spin-off economic activity. The Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce, Senator Aubin Hill, will be responsible for governance arrangements. He will publish the rules of the Jamaica Screen Fund along with guidance on how to access grants and financing, inclusive of what is expected of writers, creatives and production companies that receive support. But Dr. Clark says the fund will remain with the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service to be drawn down in tranches once the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce approves eligible projects that have completed and fulfilled the application requirements. The Drought Management Committee, a subcommittee of the Integrated Water Resources Management Council, now convenes weekly following a directive from Prime Minister Andrew Holness given the intensification of the meteorological drought impacting Jamaica. The committee has announced a multi-stakeholder approach to mitigate the effects of the drought, which includes the $100 million recently announced by the Prime Minister for trucking water into mostly rural areas that are in dire need. Other immediate measures were summarized by the National Water Commission, NWC, during this week's meeting of the committee, chaired by Minister Without Portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Senator Matthew Samuda. The measures include the Met Service guiding the NWC in the trucking of water to the most affected areas. Right now, the targeted areas include Eastern St. Thomas, sections of Portland and St. Mary, with other parishes also on the agenda. The Jamaica Constabulary Force will receive the schedule for the trucking of water to ensure the delivery is done in a safe environment. In addition, 1,400-gallon black tanks will be provided for the worst affected areas, particularly those where storage is inadequate. The NWC will also continue to regulate water supply to customers on a 12-hour supply modality. Another measure entails the transfer of water from St. Catherine to assist with the supply in Kingston and St. Andrew. The NWC is giving assurance that this measure will be undertaken without creating any undue disadvantage for the residents of St. Catherine. The forecast from the Meteorological Service of Jamaica indicates that rainfall is expected to be below normal to near normal across the island for the remainder of the dry season and ahead of the transition to the early wet season. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries is accelerating the implementation of its drought mitigation program to lessen the impact on farmers. Portfolio Minister Pernell Charles Jr. says another $110 million will be pumped into the ongoing activities, bringing the total program support to approximately $202 million. Rather than NIC and other agencies, AIC and others, uh, we continue to provide trucking of water to several drought-affected areas and farming communities, valued at over $25 million, and this is provided to farmers free of cost. And we intend to increase the reach by 100% in the coming days. Minister Charles Jr. reveals that the National Irrigation Commission, NIC, will also acquire an additional 4,000-gallon water truck by mid-March to assist the most vulnerable farming communities. We've also been supporting and will expand further the construction of our micro dams. Ten have been built, three more being built, and two more to come through the Hills to Oceans program. He was speaking at a press conference held earlier this week at the Ministry's Hope Gardens headquarters in Kingston. And finally, the Jamaica Cultural Development Commission, JCDC's National Festival of the Performing Arts, is in its second round of competition, the Parish Finals. The 2023 National Festival of the Performing Arts competition began on Wednesday, March 1 and will continue until Friday, March 24. Parish champions will be crowned across the island as finalists compete in the areas of dance, drama, music, speech and traditional folk forms. The competition is a staple on the JCDC's annual calendar, which provides cultural opportunities that benefit many Jamaicans through training, exposure and recognition. 
Acting Director of Marketing and Public Relations at the JCDC, Michelle Narising, says the festival is open to everyone. She adds that the Commission is pleased to return to full face-to-face -face parish finals since the pandemic and has seen over 6,000 entries. The detailed schedule of the parish finals may be accessed on the JCDC's website, jcdc.gov.jm. Participants can also contact the JCDC head office at 3 to 5 Phoenix Avenue, Kingston 10, or any of the Commission's offices across the island. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Theodore Henry. Thanks for watching. A bad ending can make for a good beginning. Let's look at how one principal exemplified that concept by taking a path that altered not just his life, but also those of students and teachers alike. Through a joint effort between the Ministries of National Security and Education and Youth, a 25-school strategy has been established to assess, recommend, intervene and support students who exhibit maladaptive behavior. The project was also established to inform administrators, parents and the government of the underlying reasons a child might act out violently and disruptively. St. James High School was one of the 25 institutions chosen to start the evaluation process. One reason for this is that students attending this institution were notorious for engaging in violent activities as evidenced by disturbances, altercations, stabbings and even fatalities. With this negative reputation and reality, the future for students here seemed uninspiring and disheartening for administrators and parents. But one change would be the catalyst for transformation. Joseph Williams was appointed principal of the institution and took on the job resolved to see a positive new path for St. James High. He arrived determined to instill hope in both the students and the surrounding community that anything is possible. I came here April 1, 2004 um, to a school which it was said was in a bad state in terms of students' conduct, performance, all um, negative things about it. When I came, it was like permanent recess. Students were always outside and ruly, fights and all. So <laughs> I had my plans from early as to what I would do um, to change things. I went to Church Teachers College. I specialize in social studies and geography. And social studies is key. It's about people. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was a key factor. And then my upbringing. And then I, I believe in God. After working in the educational system for 18 years, Mr. Williams knows a thing or two about how to enforce discipline. So he employed the three C's method. Conduct, content, and covenant management. He was convinced that these steps were necessary to steer the institution in the right direction. Mr. Williams' overarching goal became behavior management while utilizing strategies to increase students' skill sets, learning capacities, and interpersonal interactions. The mission of St. James High School is to establish and manage an atmosphere conducive to the holistic development of each child, teacher, and all other members of the school community embracing the fact that discipline is the essence of education while preparing students at all times through caring and sharing and we strive toward the them. The mission was initially impeded by what Mr. Williams perceived as a fundamental problem for children who found it difficult to accept discipline as an integral element of education. I remember many of these boys would say, um, Sir, I don't have no father, sir. I don't know him, no father, sir. Then kill my father, sir. And I'm saying, what? 
so I had tobacco. So it came to me now that there were so many here. That's a population of over 2,400. And it seems like I couldn't find 200 students here who live with mother and father. I declared from this balcony here to the students that I am the father. And with the assistance of Michelle Pinnock, the Ministry of Education's Regional Director for St. James, the work became doable. I think she understands what we are going through at the school and what is needed. And I'm satisfied with how, how much she, she, she will cooperate with us. As it is now, it is a school that many parents want to send their children to. Before, you used to have um, parents wanting to remove their children, but now it's a school of choice, a really a school of choice. So in every school, the teacher, the principal, teachers, everybody there should accept the students. That's where you were. And for the family support. Parenting needs to be strengthened. Parenting. Parents must take charge. You cannot have people becoming parents and you are weak. You cannot allow a gang leader to take your child. And so, through perseverance, a once lost school was restored. In the words of Principal Williams, it is the attitude that determines the altitude and then, above all else, give love. Respect for myself and others. Self-discipline means there's a right way to conflict resolution. Kindness and compassion say being nice is normal. Honesty and integrity are badges of honor. Yes, we choose values for life. So, Madam Speaker, there are 40 public sector unions and 140 public bodies. That totals 180. I'll give you approximate numbers. This abacus has 200. 10 on each row, so 100 in this one, 200 in this. Okay? Approximately 180. Now, Madam Speaker, normally what would happen in a wage negotiation is that you agree the, the number with the Confederation because the Confederation represents, the unions represent nearly 50% of public sector workers, right? And it's 11 unions in the Confederation. And once you, have, you agree, then for the, union, for the public bodies they represent, you just apply that from behind, across all the public bodies. And then you go and talk to other unions. Now, in a restructuring, that's not the case. You have to go uni not only union by union, but public body by public body. Now, Madam Speaker, the 11 unions in the, let's, this is 10, call them over here. The 11 unions in the Confederation represent 50% of the public service, approximately, rough numbers. So everybody else here constitutes the other 50 percent. Now, Madam Speaker, it, though we'd have wanted it earlier, we achieved agreement with the Confederation in November of 2022. So with these 11. And by December, we had another, giving you rough numbers, 10, 12 unions joined, so that's 20 here. That's the end of November, including, I think the nurses were in there. So here, we had 60% of the public sector with approximately 20 agreements. But the remaining 40% of the public sector, Madam Speaker, we had 100, approximately rough numbers, approximately 160 
entities to engage with between December and March. This is the complexity that we're talking about. Now, Madam Speaker, when it came to certain executive agencies, executive agencies are, were paid at a premium to the civil service. And they believe, and they have a good argument, that that premium should remain. But it came into direct conflict with one of the objectives of the exercise, that we should have uniformity across the public service. And Speaker, maybe uniformity is, is going to be achieved at another time because the executive agencies were adamant that they wanted to maintain a premium. So this was not about, for many people, not just an increase, but to make sure that their increase was such that they remained above. You see, it's not about comparison. So, and then, Madam Speaker, in addition, uh, <laughs> so, Madam Speaker, so, so, Madam Speaker, as we progressed, you would have seen things spill over into the public domain. But when you see, and here we're going to have a transparent conversation. You saw Customs and TAJ, you saw GIS, you saw uh, RGD, you saw, you know, rumors of NWA. Those are all executive agencies, okay? But you put the finger on the number of things spilling over. You're talking about maybe 10 out of the entire group of public bodies. But the context is not apparent in the newspaper on the television screen, that we're talking to all of these. But this is where the trouble is, right? Now, Madam Speaker, so it's important to understand it in its context. So, Madam Speaker, we have nevertheless proceeded to work and the members of the Transformation Implementation Unit and the Minister of Finance have been working assiduously despite setbacks. And, Madam Speaker, we have completed agreements, Madam Speaker, in terms of the public service. We have there, we have done that, we have done that, we have done that, we have done that, at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, Madam Speaker, 90, 100, 110, Madam Speaker, and a few more unions. Now remember that, so Madam Speaker, that is what we have completed. Now remember, it stops here, right? So it's not the whole thing. So Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that as at today, we have agreement, Madam Speaker, as at 2, 2 p.m. today. We have agreement, Madam Speaker, with 110 public bodies, Madam Speaker, of the 140. As I mentioned previously, perhaps your path consists of following those who came before you. Miss Lalita did just that. Please take a look. My name is Lalita Ingram Lewis. I'm from Manchester. I live in Western Jamaica. I'm a truck driver for the past 26 years. My stepfather, Jeffrey Wint, he used to drive a Buffalo Leland and he taught me how to shift the box. Then one morning he just said, carry the truck down off the hill. I could steer because I could drive a car. So I started driving trucks from I was about 10. I used to be a security officer. Then I applied for this job, and they gave me a three-month contract. Then they love how I drive. I don't destroy the truck, and I take good care, and I'm a good driver. Then they give me a one year. So since they give me the one year, so they say, you're qualified to go get the new truck. This is a Shockman truck. It has 10 speed, five high, five low. It has shanker. 
it's for the retirement dump, this dump. We're gonna be working in this dump. So yes, I'm gonna be running it. As you know, this is the steering. This is the emergency lockup brake. It's in lock position. When you want to move, you have to release it, put it down this side. It's a 10 speed box. So anytime you move it, you have to seek the clutch. This is one, two, three, down, four, five, flip the button, go over, you get six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. That's neutral. You put it down, then you select it in third, then as I said, this button on, around this side brings up the body, right? And after you tip up the body and coming back down, you have to take it out third, and you have to disengage the PTO, right? And as you can see, it's brand new. The plastic is still on it. This is the horn. It has two, two, two horn. You can do like this, and it goes. And then you have a louder horn when you press it. It goes. Okay. And it has air condition, a little radio. I would go for the the single mothers who are raising kids on their own. This is possible for my do it because I'm a single mother for Britain in my character and it, it's possible not because I've been doing it for 26 years I raised kids in between but for the girls who think that they have to depend on a guy to get their nails done their hair done they can be able to become a truck driver I wish the government though would open my trucking academy you understand so men Females, mothers can become a truck driver and inspire other girls too. I have to say thanks for my daughter who wake up five o'clock in the morning so I can come to work. She don't like it, but I said, if I don't work, you can't go to a prep school. You can't do swimming. You can't do gymnastics. So mommy got to work. So I want to say thanks for my daughter, Brittany McCarter, for helping me to accomplish my dreams. day in March must be observed and promoted by advancing active learning in the areas of conflict resolution, good citizenship, and the creation of practical acts of peace. Teaching our children about peace isn't just talking about war and conflict. Peace is about kindness, fairness, inner peace, respect for the environment, and so much more. No place more that we'd like to see peace than in our schools. We've reached the end of our program. Get a recap of everything you saw here and more on our website, jis.gov.jm. From all of us here at the JIS, in the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, don't go where the path may lead, go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. I'm Audrey Williams, bye for now. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.